Good day and welcome to the Self-Sufficiency Research Clearinghouses Connecting Opportunity Youth to Education and Employment webinar. Today's webinar is being recorded. At this time, I'd like to turn the conference over to Ms. Nicole Pexton, SSRC Education and Training Domain Specialist and Associate at ICF International. Please go ahead. Good afternoon and thank you for joining today's Self-Sufficiency Research Clearinghouse webinar, Connecting Opportunity Youth to Education and Employment. We are very happy to have a great lineup of speakers to discuss this important topic with you today. My name is Nicole Pexton and I will be facilitating today's webinar. The Self-Sufficiency Research Clearinghouse is a virtual portal of research and other resources related to self-sufficiency. It functions as an online community for researchers, practitioners, and other stakeholders interested in self-sufficiency, employment, and family and child well-being. The SSRC's purpose is to disseminate quality research. We currently have over 5,050 items in our library, and we are constantly adding new resources. The library's materials are organized into 12 topical areas that are listed in the drop-down on the slide. Every item included in the library is reviewed for relevancy. Users may search by keyword or use filters like topic area, target population, geographic location, or research methodology to browse the collection. Every topic area page under the Browse Topics tab includes an Our Library and Recommends box that highlights research, research and resources recommended by the SSRC library team. Each topical area page also includes relevant federal laws and regulations. Oh, excuse me. On the right side of your screen, you'll find some quick links to the SSRC. Select the title and then click the Browse To button for those links to open in a new window. The agenda for our webinar today includes a brief overview of Opportunity Youth, followed by our three speakers, who will speak for 15 minutes each. At the end, we will have time for questions and answers. Our presenters today will highlight the current research and strategies for connecting Opportunity Youth to education and employment. Our speakers include Dr. Harry Holzer of Georgetown University, Nick Mathern of Gateway to College National Network, and Farhana Hossein of MDRC. Dr. Harry Holzer joined the Georgetown Public Policy Institute as Professor of Public Policy in the fall of 2000. He is also currently an Institute Fellow at the American Institutes for Research, a Senior Affiliate at the Urban Institute, a non-resident Senior Fellow at the Brookings Institution, and a Research Affiliate of the Institute for Research on Poverty at the University of Wisconsin at Madison. He has also been a Faculty Director of the Georgetown Center on Poverty, Inequality, and Public Policy. Nick Mathern is Associate Vice President of Policy and Partnership Development at the Gateway to College National Network. Since 2005, he has brokered agreements between colleges, school districts, and state education agencies in order to connect communities with training, professional development, and evaluation services, as well as replication and implementation of the Gateway to College program model. Nick is also responsible for developing and executing the National Network's policy agenda, which aims to provide pathways, resources, and support services for opportunity youth to re-engage with education and achieve success in post-secondary programs. Farhana Hossein holds a dual role as Associate for Implementation Research and External Affairs at MDRC. In her research, she focuses on programs for low-income individuals who face serious barriers in the labor market, primarily disadvantaged young adults. She is an implementation lead for the evaluations of Youth Build, Pace Center for Girls, and New York City Summer Youth Employment Program. Before joining MDRC, she worked as a journalist for more than a decade at the Washington Post and the New York Times. You may submit questions at any time during the webinar using the Q&A pod in the webinar platform. If we do not get to all questions during the question and answer session, we will post responses to any unanswered questions on the SSRC in the weeks following today's presentation. And finally, we encourage you to join today's conversation on Twitter using the SSRC webinar hashtag displayed on the screen. Tweets using this hashtag will display on the left side of the webinar path platform. With that, I will turn it over to our moderator, Vanessa Marks. 
Hi, everyone. Thank you so much, Nicole, and thanks to our amazing group of panelists. I'm honored to be on this call. My name is Vanessa Marks. I am a uh, team member of the SSRC, and I'm also a senior manager at ICF International. And I'm going to talk to you briefly to help set the stage for our panelists to talk about who Opportunity Youth are and talk about how Opportunity Youth become disconnected. So there are um, kind of varying estimates on the numbers of youth who are out of school and out of work, um, you know, and they range um, from anywhere from 10 to 30 percent of the population. So we're going to kind of strike our balance in the middle there and, and share some research to say, suggest that um, 20 percent of 16 to 24-year-olds um, are out of work and out of school in the population. Now, this is a heterogeneous group, uh, right? And economists often separate this population into two big categories. Um, a little over half, 3.4 million, are what economists consider to be chronically disconnected. And the other half, a little less than half, is 3.3 million who are considered underattached. Uh, Underattached youth are young people who may have stopped and started out of school, uh, may have had a job and lost that job and are seeking other employment, um, but regardless of these attempts, they haven't found secure placement um, or a secure attachment either to school or to work. Um, a lot of these young people have been uh, disproportionately, particularly for young men of color, have been disproportionately impacted by the Great Recession. Uh, employment of young adults ages 20 to 24 currently stands at its lowest level levels in over 60 years. Some of that is due to the number of young people pursuing higher education and, and not working while they're doing so, but a significant number um, are because of the um, limited economic prospects in their local communities. The other half of the population and, and the part of the population that most of the programs and interventions that we're going to be talking about today are really focused on are what we consider chronically disconnected youth. Um, these are youth who might have a confluence of risk factors, um, so they'll be more likely to have dropped out of high school, to have had a child at a young age, uh, or to be involved in the juvenile justice system or the foster care system. And when we think about how youth become disconnected, how does a young person end up dropping out of high school or um, reaching into their mid-20s or 30s without ever having been employed? Um, I think you need to talk about and think about both developmental factors as well as sociological factors that influence that young person's trajectory. Um, and there's uh, new research that's been coming out in, in the fields of uh, neuroscience and brain development but really shining new light on how childhood experiences later impact the adults we become, um, both in terms of our um, achievements and in terms of our, our overall health. Um, there was a research study that came out a few years ago um, that was really groundbreaking that looked at the experience of violence in our communities across the nation. And it found that one in 10 children are poly, what are called poly victims of abuse and violence. Now, poly victims are individuals, uh, young people who have experienced multiple types of violence. So that could be a young person who lives in a community uh, where there's a lot of gun violence, and they also have a parent who struggles with substance abuse uh, or intimate par partner violence in that home. Um, and children who experience multiple types of abuse um, are more likely to have um, kind of poor outcomes across a variety of measures. And one of the things that this new research on brain development is finding is that these traumatic experiences or adverse childhood experiences actually can elicit what's called a toxic stress response. And toxic stress um, is, we could spend an entire webinar just on toxic stress, certainly. Um, but to kind of keep it focused for this presentation, toxic stress is a uh, condition that can happen to young people, only, only children, really. Um, you know, that's where we're focusing on the brain is particularly malleable when it's developing. Um, when the system is continually flooded with, uh, with stress hormones, and those stress hormones can actually impair the development of the brain and can, it, can affect the developing immune system system as well. Um, in particular, research has found that toxic stress can impair the development of executive function skills. And these executive functioning skills really are critical for so many of the um, 
tasks that one takes for granted in a classroom or, or in a workplace. And we all have different levels of executive functioning ability, right? We all are better or worse at certain, um, certain of these things. But executive function skills are typically categorized um, in terms of our ability to manage our emotions, manage our, our reactions uh, to stimuli, uh, control our tempers, calm ourselves down. Uh, in terms of our working memory, our ability to kind of um, follow instructions, to remember instructions that are told to us and be able to execute them, and our ability for long-term thinking and planning, be able to set goals and, and break out the tasks that are going to help us get there and then be persistent in the pursuit of those, those goals. And as you can imagine, um, these executive functioning skills really come into play at an early age in the classroom, and they continue to be important in the workplace. Now, in addition to these developmental factors for young people, um, the reality is that many of our young people experience um, discrimination and experience um, uh, inequities in terms of their experience in school uh, with the justice system and so on. These are some of the sociological factors I referenced earlier. And so um, we see, for instance, if you look just at um, the use and arrest rates of marijuana for young people, as these two charts in front of you do, you see growth disparities in terms of race. Um, as you mentioned earlier, the majority of uh, opportunity youth are youth of color. Um, and in these particular charts, you can see marijuana use uh, accounts for about 46% of all the drug arrest rates for young people in this country. So it's a huge gateway to the juvenile justice system. Um, and you can see on the left-hand side that uh, marijuana use rates um, among among 18 to 25 year olds um, can looked at by race, white versus black, you can see that usage is fairly similar, although the, um, although the usage for whites is actually slightly higher. And then if you look to the right, you can see a gross disparity in terms of arrest rates and how much higher it is for, your, for um, black individuals. So policing and justice involvement looks very different um, depending on race and, and as well in terms of socioeconomic status. We also see a lot of racial disparities in terms of school discipline. So black students are suspended or expelled at three times the rate of white students. And that matters because students who are suspended or expelled even once have a risk of dropping out of high school um, more than double that of their peers. Um, and then finally, we see an important and, and troubling impact of racial discrimination uh, on hiring for young people as well. In a now famous study that was conducted in New York City in 2010, a group of researchers took a group of young people of similar educational and socioeconomic backgrounds but different races, sent them out with resumes and, and kind of backstories to uh, apply for jobs. And what they found is that the probability of getting a call back from an employer fell by nearly two-thirds if a young black man had a criminal record. So for young people who have gotten involved in the juvenile justice system at a young age who might have a criminal record um, that the employer can access or at a significant disadvantage. And perhaps even um, more concerning, young white men with criminal records received higher rates of callbacks than young black men with no records at all. Um, so these sociological factors really have a direct impact on young people's experience as they try to progress through school and as they, uh, as they attempt to move into employment. And so I know these are um, not the most uplifting statistics to share with you to start us off today. Um, but before handing it over to our panelists, I do want to talk about some of the science behind resilience. Why do we think programs, nonprofits or, or publicly run programs, can make a difference? Um, you know, when you're facing these kinds of obstacles. And the reason is because, again, going back to the recent research on brain development, we know that adolescents in particular, uh, which is when this, uh, this age range we're talking about really uh, begins, adolescence is a time of great um, neuroplasticity in the brain. The brain is changing and is more open to, um, to influence by its environment uh, during the time of adolescence. And so adolescence can be a very important time to intervene with young people to help them further develop the executive functioning skills that are going to be so important for their future success and to help open doors that might otherwise be closed. 
Um, the young adult brain isn't bad as well. Uh, there's a lot of um, continuing development that happens really through your 20s. So if you look at this chart that's from the uh, Harvard Center for the Developing Child, it shows um, the rate at which executive functioning skills are, are uh, developing, how proficient one is in executive functioning um, across age. So you can see a huge jump between the ages of three and five, but there's also an increase in your mid-20s. Um, unfortunately for me and for others on the call, it decreases after that. <laughs> but, um, but, there, but young adulthood uh, is, a, is a time of significant change for the brain, and which leads us to believe that it is a great time for interventions as well. So with that, I'm going to turn it over uh, to uh, Dr. Harry Holzer uh, to talk with us about connecting opportunity youth to education and employment. Thank you, Dr. Holzer. Uh, thank you, Vanessa, and uh, thank you for uh, having me uh, participate today. Uh, I, I want to start off by presenting a, a broad overview of, of what we know about what works uh, and what may, maybe doesn't work uh, in, in terms of uh, improving education and employment outcomes for Opportunity Youth, and, and I want to cover sort of three topics. Uh, firstly, I want to hone in specifically on, on what I think the major barriers are for Opportunity Youth uh, in terms of improving their education and employment outcomes. Uh, uh, Vanessa covered a lot of this material already, but I want to focus on, on what I think are the three or four biggest barriers to doing better in terms of education and employment. Uh, then I'll briefly mention a few concepts and distinctions that, that help us think about this work. Uh, and then finally go through some, some evidence on policies and programs and, and what we know from the evaluation research. So uh, first of all, when I think of what the barriers are uh, to getting better education and employment outcomes uh, for this group of youth, I mostly think of three things. Uh, first of all, uh, these young people usually do bad in school in, in terms of educational achievement. Uh, educational performance is measured by things like grades and test scores. Uh, the low levels of achievement limit their ability to, to have educational attainment, to finish their high school diplomas, to get some kind of post-secondary credential, but it also limits their ability to engage in serious job training uh, or, or in terms of getting and keeping and performing well in, in a range of jobs that, that pay well. So, so that's one set of problems. The second problem is it, it's not so much uh, about the individual youth and their attainment, uh, it, it's about the high schools they attend. Uh, frankly, they attend a lot of lousy high schools. Uh, many of these high schools lack uh, serious services and outreach to the young people. They lack high quality career and technical education uh, or any other positive offerings. Some of them constitute what we call dropout factories, large urban or occasionally large rural high schools that, that offer these young people very little. Uh, and, and they often fall between the cracks and have very high dropout rates. In addition to those problems, I, I think a lot of these young people have difficulty picking up early labor market experience. They have very weak connections to the job market. Uh, therefore, they don't develop uh, a lot of work readiness, a lot of the basic rules uh, about behavior in a job showing up on time every day and how you relate to your employer and to coworkers. They don't develop that work readiness. Uh, even if they do, uh, they send bad signals to employers based on that lack of early experience uh, that, that hinders their ability to gain jobs in the future. So I'm going to talk about those three barriers and, and the sets of policies and programs that address uh, each of them. Before going there, let me just mention a few key concepts and distinctions to keep in mind as we go through that evidence. First of all, there's a lot of variation uh, in the disconnect. And again, uh, Vanessa hinted at that uh, in terms of their levels of basic skills and their work readiness. Not all of them are hard to serve. Not all of them are hard to employ. Uh, but some of them are. Uh, some of them are only reading at, at maybe the sixth grade level. It makes it very hard uh, for them to, to improve their educational outcomes or, or to get them to better jobs. Some of them uh, have been traumatized in the past. Some of them uh, have criminal records. Uh, and all of these create much more serious barriers uh, than, than some other individuals have. Um, and, and what that means is you're probably going to need different kinds of policies and programs for, for different people along that spectrum. Secondly, it's important to distinguish between prevention strategies for young people who are still in high school but at risk of disconnecting versus reconnection strategies for those who have already disconnected, who have usually dropped out of high school uh, and, and not connected to the job market. Uh, thirdly, when we talk about strategies, when we talk about what we know about programs and policies, it's important to distinguish between the promising uh, and the proven. Uh, what I call proven is anything that has 
been rigorously evaluated, uh, and that means usually by either a random assignment experiment uh, or another serious statistical methodology. Other programs that have good outcomes and maybe achieve some scale, those are promising but not yet proven. But even among the proven, uh, a lot of these programs are small, uh, and they face big challenges of, of being replicated, uh, and being scaled to a level where they can really make a difference, and, and in terms of, of achieving funding. So we want to keep all of these criteria in mind as we look at these programs. So first I want to talk about a set of programs designed to prevent disconnection. This is for young people at risk but who are still are in high school. And the first thing we would like to see uh, is programs that raise their academic achievement, you know, their, their reading achievement, their math achievement. There are programs that target younger people like Success for All that uh, have been rigorously evaluated and that work quite well. Success for All does not go into the high school years. There are other programs that go into the high school years. I don't know of any that have been rigorously evaluated, uh, but if they're out there, that would be a good first step. Secondly, uh, a lot of these youth need more than just uh, academic uh, uh, achievement and radiation. Uh, they need a range of, of personal supports and social supports, mentoring services, uh, and other kinds of intensive services at the high school level. There's a good paper by John Tyler and Magnus Lostrom in 2009 that reviews a range of these programs and what we know about them. Thirdly, high quality career and technical education can really make a difference for these young people. Uh, the one I think that has been most rigorously evaluated and, and that has achieved some scale uh, is the Career Academy, which uh, is a small school within a broader school uh, that targets a particular industry, uh, healthcare academies, IT academies, uh, and that, that has been evaluated and shows very strong effects on people's uh, subsequent earnings. There are other good models of, of high quality career and technical education, like high schools that work, linked learning in California. Uh, they don't yet have rigorous evidence showing that they work well. Finally, if we look at these dropout factories, uh, there's been one very successful program that I know of uh, in the city of New York to restructure them. Uh, and that program was called Small Schools of Choice, where they took a few of these big dropout factories, they broke them up into smaller schools. Each school had a special theme career schools, uh, arts and music schools, they let students then self-select into those different schools based on their interests. And if they got into those schools, they were much more motivated uh, to engage in those schools. And the evaluation of small schools of choice showed very positive uh, improvements in, in high school graduation and in performance. So the idea is not just to break dropout factories into from big, lousy schools to little, lousy schools, but to break them up into schools that have a theme and a purpose that young people can really uh, engage in uh, more enthusiastically. Now, what about young people that have already disconnected? Uh, we have a set of programs that either prepare them for or help them attend uh, high school and then, and then post-secondary credentials. Now, again, some of these programs target young people that, that come in with slightly better skills, and, and I'll list uh, the Gateway to College program as one of those, uh, and, and Nick, uh, one of the next speakers, will, will talk about those a lot more. But what about programs that don't target uh, young people who have done particularly well? Um, first, this is a program like the National Guard Challenge Program. Uh, the National Guard Challenge Program is, is actually funded by the Department of Defense. Uh, it is a residential program. Young people live in dorms, uh, and, and they are military in style. In other words, these programs try to impose some real structure and real discipline on these young people while they try to finish high school or at least get their GEDs. Uh, and when evaluated, uh, they had a high success rate. That, that structure, that military structure, w w was a, a quite useful and, and positive experience for many of them. Another approach for people that have already maybe finished that work or trying to finish it uh, is the bridge program before they actually set foot on campus. One of the most successful ones that we've seen so far is the LaGuardia Community College Program in New York City that helped people as they were preparing for their GED tests uh, or, or for remedial programs in college. Uh, LaGuardia actually embedded a lot of the information in labor market information, uh, labor market information about healthcare or about IT. So when they would teach concepts, they would uh, embed it in that information, and that often made people more interested in learning the material. Similarly, remediation programs that are located on college campuses, one of the best known is IBEST in the state of Washington, where instead of having, having standalone remediation, the remedial instructors were actually placed into the real classrooms. So every time people came across a concept that they had some trouble with, 
the remedial instructor would step in and teach them what they need to know. So by embedding it, again, people were much more interested in the material. And there's other uh, very promising programs like Quantway and, and some other reform programs for remediation. And lastly, I'd like to mention ASAP, a program at the SUNY University in New York for, for uh, hard to serve young people in college. Uh, this program required them to go full time and then provided a wide range of supports and services and it doubled uh, the rate at which people completed two-year college programs at, at CUNY. So that was a very positive result. Now what about programs that try to reach out to the disconnected and connect them to the job market rather than uh, to the world of secondary or post-secondary. Again, there are some programs that work very well for people with better skills, like the Year Up program. Um, that requires people already to have a high school diploma or GED. But there are some programs, again, that target people somewhat further down the spectrum. Uh, there's a range of, of positive summer youth employment programs uh, that people are becoming aware of. Amy Schwartz has a nice review paper uh, and a Hamilton paper for a few years ago. One of the most notable is called Becoming a Man, a Chicago program which combines some CBT, cognitive and behavioral therapy, with a summer job. And they try to teach people how to avoid dangerous or violent situations. And that's had some nice strong results. There are older programs like Job Corps. That's a residential program uh, dating back to the original War on Poverty. It's an expensive program because it's residential. The initial impacts are quite positive, though they do tend to fade out over time. Uh, there are transitional jobs programs, uh, often for people coming out of prison uh, or having some other uh, major form of discipline. Uh, these programs don't necessarily improve employment rates afterwards, but they do tend to uh, reduce recidivism, recidivism rates uh, when they are uh, positive in nature. Uh, there's a few other uh, employment programs, uh, pre-apprenticeship programs, uh, the Youth Opportunity Program. Uh, which I was involved with at the end of the Clinton administration that targeted low-income neighborhoods. Uh, and each low-income neighborhood put a, a youth center, which then helped to connect young people to uh, education or employment resources. And of course, there's a range of policies, I think, that would help make these programs more effective, modestly raising the minimum wage, uh, extending the earned income tax credit to, uh, uh, to people without, young people without children, like non-custodial adults, et cetera. So just to wrap up, uh, what do we learn from all this? The notion that nothing works at all, the stereotype that nothing works at all, is very clearly wrong, very clearly inaccurate. Uh, but what we learn from this material, I think, is that there's a range of different remedies for different populations uh, who are at different stages of the disconnection process. One size does not fit all. You really need to uh, target different remedies and different programs uh, for people with different circumstances. We've had different levels of evaluation of these programs. Uh, some of them I think we could call proven. Uh, others remain promising. But even among the proven programs, replication and scale uh, is always a challenge. And funding for replicating and scaling is always a challenge. And, and so all of those challenges uh, are still out there. Uh, there is some good encouraging results out there. Uh, and. Uh, we just need to further move ahead on this kind of work. Uh, and I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Hello? Great. Oh, hey. Thank you so much, Harry. Now we'll move on to, uh, to Nick Mathern. Please go ahead. Thanks so much. And uh, thanks, everyone, for joining. I'm going to have an opportunity to tell you a little bit about Gateway to College. Uh, you heard uh, Harry mention our name, and I want to tell you a little bit about the way that Gateway to College does re-engagement for out of school and off-track youth through a college-based high school completion program. Um, I want to briefly address the answers to hopefully four questions. Uh, we'll start out just giving you a brief description of what is Gateway to College. Uh, we'll talk about who do our programs serve, what are the essential elements for success, and how do we consider the impact our partners are having in order to assist them with continuous improvement. So Gateway to College is a unique collaboration between school districts and colleges. It is essentially a early college program or a dual enrollment program that is designed for struggling youth. And so the, the students in Gateway to College programs have either previously dropped out of high school or they've been identified by their counselors as unable to graduate in their mainstream school. So it's, it's turning the idea of early college um, for high-performing students or even the academic middle students 
turning it on its head and saying we want to make sure that we give these post-secondary pathways to our most struggling students. And it's also a program that takes place on a college campus. And so these are programs that tend to, to be um, at the college site and often run by the, the college. And it's really a unique collaboration in that it, it features not only um, out of school or off track youth being re-engaged and coming back to school at the college, but also there's revenue sharing between the college and the school district, and that's a real key. So that K-12 dollar that got turned off when a student dropped out of school is now turned back on and it is passed through, or maybe uh, some percentage of it is passed through from the district to the college to serve those students in the, in the college environment. Now, I say that, but not exclusively. Some of our programs are actually run by the school district. It's, it's really a matter of, of, of local governance questions in terms of what works best in a given community. Um, but one of the things that we're encouraged by is that communities are really responding to this as an opportunity because they recognize that dual enrollment is a powerful um, motivator to get out of school and off track youth back into education. So for students who had previously sort of given up on their identity as, an ed as a student or saw themselves, unfortunately, as failures, the idea that they would actually be able to be successful college students and receive what amounts to a scholarship to attend can be very empowering. Um, and so it's, it's useful for helping to get more students back to education for K-12 completion. It also has an additional benefit for colleges of, of increasing the readiness pipeline because we know that many out-of-school youth um, will ultimately um, perhaps lend on the, on the footsteps at the college for adult basic ed maybe in their 20s. And so if we can reconnect with them immediately, um, we can help to create a, a more prepared and give more support to, to young people to enter the college uh, at a traditional age. A little bit about who our students are. You'll see here on the left our student eligibility profile. Um, in most states where we operate, um, our, our students need to be between the ages of 16 and 21 years old. That's simply to have the K-12 dollars to follow them. They need to be out of school or on the verge of dropping out. And they need to be behind in credits for their age. Um, many of our programs are looking specifically for students with a 2.0 or lower GPA. So again, turning that idea of dual enrollment on its head. Um, and, and not all of our districts do that. There's certainly some young people who are really good candidates who may have been strong um, students before they left school, but maybe a pregnancy or another health issue or um, some behavior referral might have meant that, that their mainstream high school was no longer a good fit for them. Um, the, all of that said, um, to Harry's point about students being prepared, um, these are students who are going to ultimately be taking college courses and, and in most cases on short order. So most of our communities, not exclusively all of them, but most of them do also require students to have an eighth grade reading level. And so this, this is one solution among many for school districts and colleges that are looking for a way to re-engage out of school youth. You can see on the right hand side our student profile. Um, our students are about 17 years old at entry. They've got a 1.6 high school GPA, just half the credits they need to graduate. Uh, last year we enrolled 64 percent students of color, 77 uh, percent first generation college students, and 68 percent are low income. Um, and then quickly here, I want to talk about what is it about Gateway to College that is effective for students. And, and we've got five program essential elements. I'm only, for the interest of time, going to really give any detail to three of them. I'm going to talk to you about the significant dual credit, the sustainable partnerships, and the holistic student support. Um, of course, innovative teaching and learning and intentional collaboration are critically important. Um, I think that they might not be as unique to our program as, as the first three elements. Um, but in terms of significant dual credit, this is really the flag that gets students' attention and gets them excited about coming back to school. The opportunity to come to college and, and have that paid for and what is essentially a college scholarship is, is really powerful. Um, when we started this work 15 years ago, um, our attitude was, this was based on the program that started here at Portland Community College, that we wanted to see um, all students taking all college classes. And, and we were doing that here at Portland Community College. But what we found as we replicated the program, and we've grown this now over the past um, 13 years, we're now operating programs in 20 states at 40 different colleges, we found that an all-college model really led to uneven results. And in many communities, students were not academically able to take advantage of that 
that opportunity. We were having very uneven results, and, and as a result, we've now really moved in the direction of a model that balances K-12 and college instruction based on really understanding student readiness and, and making sure that, that we're putting students up to an opportunity that's a challenge, but not too far of a challenge for them to achieve. Uh, in terms of sustainable partnerships, the, I mentioned the shared revenue, and that's really a critical piece for this. Um, neither institution could do this on their own. So the fact that K-12 dollars are available to support young people is really critical because the colleges, especially two-year public colleges, have very modest resources available and couldn't provide the necessary uh, wraparound student support needed for previously struggling students to be successful in the college environment. Uh, the college also um, makes contributions to this work and the fact that, that you're in a college facility and taking advantage of the college campus and all that it has to offer um, is, is really a critical piece. I want to acknowledge that for the 40 communities that do this work, it doesn't just happen. Um, getting shared priorities between school principals and superintendents and college presidents is, is not an easy thing to do, not because they don't all have that kind of um, ultimate vision of, of serving our communities um, on the horizon, but they've got disparate accountability measures, they've got disparate funding structures, and it is very difficult for institutions to make compromises around what their accountability efforts look like and how they how they go about serving youth. But when you can have leaders who are willing to see a common vision and, and see a strategy to achieve that, it can be very powerful. So the partnerships are absolutely critical. Um, one of our um, things that we always have to remember about this is that a partnership um, is something that needs to be attended to. We have a college president in our network who's um, said uh, many times, the cows don't stay milked. And, and, and really that's about making sure that we are going back to our leaders and, and making sure that they understand the benefits that their commitment has for the young people in their communities. And the, I mentioned sustainable, excuse me, I mentioned the, the uh, dual credit as a critical piece for attracting students to school. It's absolutely necessary. But the thing that keeps them there is the fact that we provide personalized relationships once they're in the program. This is really the critical piece. Um, students across the country in any of our 40 programs will tell you the thing that makes a difference for them when they are in this program, which tend to be small programs. Programs um, on campuses doing Gateway to College tend to be from 100 to 150 students, so not a lot of students. Um, the, the thing that makes a difference for them is that they feel known, they feel recognized by a caring adult on campus. And we use a model of having coaches or resource specialists who have a small caseload of students that they are attending to on a regular basis. Um, we really want to make sure students develop a, a sense of belonging because they tell us that that is not something that they had in their previous sending high school where they felt like they weren't known either by their peers or by administrators. Um, and we need to acknowledge that those barriers that students face that led them to leave school in the first place or led them to get behind, um, those barriers that Vanessa spoke to at the beginning, um, don't go away just because students start to achieve academic success. They still live in the same neighborhood that they previously lived in. They still face the same challenges. And so continuing to have um, really robust student, uh, student support is absolutely critical. I don't know if you'll be able to read the print on this, um, but ultimately what I'm just using this slide for here is to just give you a sense of the trajectory that students are on when they come to Gateway to College. They'll be in the program from anywhere from one to three years. And the foundation experience is usually a one or two semester experience where they're taking courses together in a, in a learning community with other Gateway to College students, learning two things. One, remediating academic skills that they may have missed from having not taken um, you know, their core coursework in high school, but also learning the habits of mind and the student skills needed to do time management, to apply study skills, to make sure that they're learning how to communicate with instructors so that when they matriculate into college coursework, they can be successful. Um, as they move on, they, they do matriculate into a variety of courses. They're no longer part of a learning community, although they may come back to gateway offices and gateway classrooms to continue some of their K-12 instruction while they're also co-enrolled in college courses alongside of adult learners who are paying tuition to be there. Um, the gateway experience and the robust holistic support that they get continues until they've earned enough high school credits to complete a high school credential. Um, that will vary. Some students might come to us with zero high school credits and need, and they'll be with us for three years, 
Others may be relatively close to graduation and, and able to finish up in a single year. Uh, in terms of the impact that these programs are having, um, I mentioned that we're at 40 um, colleges, 41 colleges in 21 states. Last year, uh, we enrolled uh, just under 4,500 students, and our students graduated with an average of 20 college credits. Um, in addition to the graduates, if you look at all of our students who are enrolled, um, that really amounted to K-12 dollars, providing the equivalent of $6.8 million in scholarships for students to be enrolled in courses. That's in addition to their, their books, their transportation, and, and meals, and the student support being covered. Um, and, and we're going to have a relationship in an ongoing situation with the National Student Clearinghouse. Uh, that's not in place yet, but one thing I can refer to is a, a 2012 study that showed that 73% of our graduates are continuing to enroll in post-secondary education after being involved with Gateway to College. So that's a little bit about our impact. Now I want to talk for a moment about the ways in which we're doing learning about, about the work. I mentioned that we had seen um, uneven results, uh, especially as it had to do with students um, taking college coursework. And, and we were, you know, we're always wondering about you know, what is the root of that? Has it, does it have to do with implementation? Does it have to do with the sending school districts or the communities from which students are coming? And so you know, I'm just going to share with you a little bit of information about um, five communities from our network that, that are relatively successful around questions of persistence and um, high school completion. And, and one of the reasons I'm, I'm going to look at this is because what we see here is that there is not necessarily a relationship between their success around completion or persistence and the, the demographics of the sending community. So for example, in community A, we, we are looking at a community where 95% of students are in a zip code where high school diploma attainment is below the national average, and 97% of them live in a zip code where bachelor's degree attainment is below the national average. So you know, a, a community where education is, is really uh, lower than average. In community B, we're looking at students who are 99% um, students of color, and 89% um, students live in high poverty communities. So, you know, again, um, students who, who may face economic barriers and, and, and barriers in terms of, um, you know, structural racism, et cetera, that we heard, heard about earlier. And then community C. Um, I mentioned to you at the beginning that our, um, on average, our, our students are entering with about a 1.6 GPA. Uh, if we look back over three years, there's about 1.59 here. And, but in Community C, the students were entering with an with a, um, average GPA of 1.14, so substantially lower than the rest of our network and in the seventh percentile of all of our gateway college GPAs nationally. So I, I share these three profiles to give you a sense of kind of where they are, but relative to the, the measurement that we do, um, they are having um, success around student completion. So you can see here, over five communities, and I'm sorry I haven't had a chance to give you five profiles, but I just wanted to give you a snapshot here. But across these five communities, you can see, um, you know, they're, they are certainly holding their own among our other programs with regards to um, student completion. And in some of you who might be looking from traditional K-12 education, um, you know, you may be wondering, you know, are, these might look very low for, for traditional high school graduation rates, but among students who previously left or who already missed the graduation window at their mainstream high school, um, you know, these are actually um, very reasonable and, and we're very pleased to see rates like this. You can see we've, we've established a benchmark for our network of a 50% completion rate of the high school credential. Um, and then I want to also look at the flip side of that because I mentioned that we have seen some challenges uh, around having an all-college environment and then as a result some of our programs have, have shifted to offer a lot more K-12 instruction, still doing so in the college environment and still doing so um, in a situation where there's an expectation that students will continue to be enrolled at college. But you can see that our national average of, of 20 college credits among these five programs, those students are, those programs are graduating um, with many fewer college credits. In one case, you'll see that um, few students graduate with, with more than one college class completed. And so that does speak to the tension, and I want to acknowledge that there is tension among our programs, especially, um, you know, when we're looking at trying to ad address, um, you know, issues of attendance or issues of persistence for students who had previously struggled. Uh, I don't have it here, but one thing I'll also mention is that 
with that that 1.6 GPA that we see at entry, um, that does increase significantly. And what we're finding nationally is that um, in their first semester in the Gateway to College program, students have a 2.6 GPA. So still perhaps not all straight A's, but a substantial increase after um, transitioning into this program. A little bit about how we work with our partners. Um, we provide a great deal of training and technical assistance to programs, and for the purposes of the conversation we're having here today, um, we do data collection and analysis and program evaluation for the purposes of continuous improvement. And so we're very interested in questions that you may have about the continued continuous improvement of, of this particular model and how this can be implemented effectively in other communities, um, whether it be under the name Gateway to College or simply with the concept of creating post-secondary pathways throughout a school youth. And that's where I land, and I will turn it over to Farhana. Um, thank, thank you so you, much, Nick. Nick. Oh. Go Sorry. ahead, Farhana. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, I will apologize for my voice. I'm a little under the weather, so bear with me. Um, I'm Farhana Hossein, and I'm a research associate at MDRC. Um, we are a nonprofit, nonpartisan education and social policy research organization, and we're focused on learning what works to improve programs and policies for low-income communities. Um, and many of the programs and evaluations that um, Dr. Holzer mentioned today, including Career Academies, National Guard Challenge, GED Bridge, and um, ASAP, um, uh, were, we were involved with. Um, and so today I'm going to focus specifically on the employment uh, piece. Um, as you know, and as, as Vanessa has mentioned, uh, unemployment and disconnection continues to be a big challenge, especially for low-income and minority youth. Um, and there is a concrete need for increase, increased investment in strategies um, that we can take to improve um, the employment prospects for our young adults. So Dr. Hoser has already walked you through the research evidence on youth programs that have proven to be successful in improving outcomes. Um, so today, what I'm going to do is walk you through some features that are shared by successful work-oriented programs for youth. I'd like to reiterate his statement that there is no one-size-fits-all solution. Um, this is a diverse group of 7 million um, young adults. Um, and so what I'm going to do is just going to talk about some of the components that we've found to be uh, common in successful work-oriented programs for youth. Um, then I'll give you a brief overview of some promising models that are currently being tested for effectiveness. Um, and I'll end with some thoughts on what we've learned from our research about engaging employers and work initiatives for youth. So, what works? So these are, these are some of the, um, the five com uh, features uh, from uh, successful programs that we've found uh, in our synthesis of rigorous evaluations. Um, while classroom training is important in building um, job skills, um, we find that work experience in a real workplace context gives youth opportunity to apply what they've learned and to create a network that they can then leverage. Um, for future opportunities. For example, um, someone that can give them a reference or lead them to other jobs. Um, work experience in the real world also provides an opportunity to learn the ever important soft skills, how to dress, how to talk to coworkers, how to negotiate challenges that come up. Um, stipends or other types of financial in incentives are an important source of support to meet the economic challenges these young people face. Um, not only do they enable continuous engagement, they can be a key form of positive reinforcement to sustain motivation, especially when they are tied to milestones like acquiring specific competencies or earning a credential. Um, some recent research also suggests that the quality of the work experience may also be really important. Uh, Low-wage work that is not connected to a career pathway or that young people perceive to have no value may not be as effective as work experience that gives them skills for future advancement or the satisfaction of creating value for themselves or for the community. Um, recently, um, I 
we did a survey of about 100 youth build program directors, and uh, many of the program directors said that even if youth didn't go into um, construction, um, they took great pride in, in participating in community service projects where they constructed um, or participated in constructing you know, low-income housing um, or other types of structures in the community because they, it gave them a concrete sense of accomplishment. Um, the next is a strong link between training and the job market. Um, so as Dr. Holzer mentioned, evidence from um, career technical education and sector-based training programs suggests that education and training that are shaped by um, identifiable opportunities in the local labor market and that have um, employer involvement, direct employer Im involvement can produce strong outcomes for youth. So CTE programs like career academies in high schools and sector-based programs like Europe, they design their training curricula with input from employer partners and also get employer commitments to sponsor and provide on-the-job training. Um, these kinds of demand-driven models are, um, as you may know, at the center of uh, new workforce development strategies, not just for youth but also for adults. Um, the current consensus is that interventions should begin with an analysis of local labor market trends and employer needs in high growth industries. And then, and then we uh, can move on to developing supply side strategies around skill building in conjunction with employers um, and their organizations. Um, the next is addressing developmental, developmental needs of youth. And this was covered by Vanessa um, and Nick. Um, this won't come as a surprise to most of you, but programs that work for adults don't necessarily always work for youth. Um, as Vanessa um, has showed, um, recent, re uh, recent research says that brain development in young people continues through their mid-20s um, and that you know, capacity for mature decision-making continues to evolve well past teenage years. Um, especially in the areas of the brain that's responsible for um, cognitive functioning, things like decision making and reasoning and impulse control. Um, so, you know, that's why there's the high level of risk taking behaviors and highly emotional responses um, during teenage years. Um, brain development can also be slowed for those exposed to trauma and stress. Um, and practitioners and youth experts recommend that programs should not only provide participants with training or jobs, but also expose them to activities and relationships that are thought to promote healthy development across a wide range of domains. Um, some of the more effective programs place a lot of importance on supporting the personal and professional growth of young people um, through training in life skills and workplace behavior, opportunities for leadership development, and fostering interpersonal connections with staff and peers. Um, some programs we've partnered with say that enrolling young people in a series of small cohorts as opposed to um, admitting them on a rolling basis uh, can encourage engagement um, by you know, creating peer relationships and um, creating a sense of community. Um, uh, we also hear that it's important to hire staff who share similar backgrounds and experiences um, to make meaningful and lasting connections with youth. Um, young people with lower levels of academic and vocational skills can also become frustrated when they don't make fast progress towards their goal of employment um, or higher education and often stop engaging. And for them, it's really important to manage their expectations um, from program services um, and set short and long-term goals from the outset. So so the young people can feel a, feel a sense of accomplishment if they're able to achieve some of the short-term goals and persist if they can visualize how these achievements relate to their long-term goals. Um, next is support services to address barriers. Nick has already gone through a lot of this um, um, as Gateway recognizes the need to address barriers faced by its students and offers holistic supports and we find that we found in our analysis that um, most of the successful programs, um, you, you know, provide 
individualized support services to address barriers of use. Um, the top ones we hear about are access to child care and transportation um, and uh, partnerships with other agencies and programs in the local community um, are key to meeting some of these needs since no one you know, program can or funding stream can directly meet all of a young person needs. Um, going back to the developmental and mental health needs among disadvantaged young people, um, case managers and youth counselors from successful programs have reported using um, various evidence-informed practices like trauma-focused cognitive behavioral therapy or motivational interviewing um, to address their mental health needs. And many programs have also established partnerships with local mental health providers for more um, intensive clinical therapy. Um, it's also really important to set clear and consistent expectations um, around program, program rules and um, while allowing flexibility to address challenges, um, you know, these young people, there are, these young people have various types of barriers and, um, you know, coming to a program every single day or, or meeting all of the requirements may not be um, always possible for them, but um, setting up clear expectations around those um, uh, rules are still very important to make sure um, that there's growth. Um, the next is quite important for not only just youth program, but also um, we found in workforce development programs in general. Um, job, job placement is often considered the end outcome of many of the programs, but for most disadvantaged young adults, uh, you know, it's the only the beginning of their journey. Um, for many um, youth, problems and stresses emerge after they are placed in a job and start working. Um, for example, young women with children may discover that their child care arrangements are less reliable than they expected, or they may realize that they do not know how to handle conflicts with fellow workers or managers. So young people um, need continued post-placement support to help them adapt to their jobs, um, address any personal or situational problems that could undermine um, steady work and um, also importantly to identify opportunities to move up and to identify opportunities to pursue further education and training to progress in their careers. Um, that was an overview of what we know from existing research. Um, there's a lot of exciting research underway by MDRC and other organizations to build and strengthen the evidence around effective strategies to improve employment outcomes for youth. Um, there are efforts to strengthen the evidence around career pathway approaches and apprenticeships. Um, MDRC is working on an evaluation of New York City Summer Youth Employment Program, which is the largest summer jobs program in the country. Um, we're going to be following summer youth for up to eight years to understand the impact of a summer job on their education and employment outcomes. Um, we're also working on an evaluation of the Youth Build program um, that I mentioned that provides vocational training, educational services, leadership training, and various other supports to youth. Um, lastly, we're also exploring models that combine the cognitive behavioral therapy with traditional employment approaches like subsidized job. Um, CBT is an evidence-based technique that is used to help people identify problematic thoughts, um, and feelings and see how they're connected to um, negative behaviors. Um, uh, the power of CBT, you know, stems from the idea that um, troubled behavior is not inherent, rather that it can be traced back to patterns of thoughts and distorted perceptions that are learned. Um, and it, you know, group-based CBT um, are widely used in juvenile and criminal justice systems and in other contexts, and it's been shown to have positive effects, so we are hoping to develop some work around um, uh, work in integrating um, those approaches into employment programs. Last but not least, um, we have to have employer engagement at a large scale to be able to create um, training and work opportunities that are valuable for young people in the long run. Um, uh, you know, workforce development organizations will need to increase, fo you know, focus on the skills that employers are looking for, which means 
um, you know, trying to engage them in their initiatives. Um, so how do we get more employers involved? So federal efforts to engage employers in workforce initiatives have generally relied on you know, financial incentives like wage subsidies um, and tax credits. And those remain important tools, especially for youth with no work history or youth with a lot of barriers. Um, but incentives may not be the only reason why employers participate in work-related programs for youth. Um, different employers have different needs um, and therefore different motivations to participate in, in workforce activities. Um, some studies have pointed to a sense of social responsibility, philanthropy, um, public recognition as motivating factors. Um, in the long run, employers are more likely to engage in youth employment efforts if it's easy for them to do so, um, and if they believe it is a positive opportunity for their business. Um, we, recently, we recently held a forum on youth employment with some um, well-known experts, including Dr. Holzer, um, and the consensus was that efforts to engage employers should include a marketing component to educate them about the potential of a young and diverse workforce. Um, and to debunk myths about young workers and public or nonprofit workforce programs that may be based in stereotypes. For example, um, there was a recent GAO report that found that employers engaged in local one-stop centers only when hiring for low-skill, low-wage jobs because they um, misperceived the skills of the one-stop labor pool. Um, programs and providers can also work with intermediary organizations to better align their services and training with employer needs and provide assistance to youth. Um, they can be played by a var variety of uh, organizations, including chambers of commerce, trade associations, labor management partnerships, community colleges, um, and private recruitment firms. Um, we also have to better understand um, how the changing nature of work and hiring practices um, affect the way young people interact with employers. Um, you know, Everything is computerized, you know, everything is on the Internet. More and more employers are turning to temporary staffing arrangements to increase their workforce flexibility. Um, many employers are transferring all or part of their recruitment process to external providers. Um, and since some of these third-party actors serve as, you know, the first line of contact between many employers um, and youth, um, programs should explore how they can engage in um, th these third-party providers in, in trying to create work opportunities for youth. Okay, I, my time is up, but I'm going to wrap up. Um, here are just some my last thoughts around engaging employers in youth employment. As I said, putting more resources and staff into job development. Um, but, you know, staff with some nuanced understanding of the local labor market and with business or sales experience so that they can speak to employers in their language. Um, messaging could be key. Um, depending on the need and the motivation of the employers, you can appeal to their bottom line, their sense of social and community responsibility, or both. Some recent research recommend that, that to engage employers, you know, you should tailor your communication to different staff members, for example, emphasizing efficiency to a production line manager, um, um, social mission or diversity to the HR staff, or, or a hybrid approach at the leadership level. Um, we also have to educate employers in effective youth development and supervision practices to ensure that, you know, once connected, youth are actually engaged and, and, and can retain jobs. Um, there is some evidence that even employers who engage in the public workforce system and youth education and employment programs have limited knowledge about how these programs work and the support services that are available to young people. Um, um, also, frontline staff who manage young workers often do not receive any training or guidance in supporting the development and professional growth of youth. So programs should explore how they can engage and educate work supervisors on low effort, strength-based ways to support young workers um, without focusing too much on their barriers or stigmatizing them. So I'm going to end there. If you know. Come to our website if you want to find out more about um, the research that we're working on pertaining to disconnected youth. Wonderful. Thank you, Thank you so much, Farhana.
So we're going to transition now to a Q&A. Um, so please submit your questions to, uh, to Dr. Holzer, uh, Nick, or Farhana through the question and answer feature, which is in the bottom right of the screen. And also feel free to continue tweeting uh, using the hashtag SSRCWebinar. Um, and so we've gotten a number of questions already, which is great. So I'm going to start uh, asking those. Uh, and I'll, I'll direct them to uh, one of you on the panel, but others feel free to chime in if you have other things to add. Um, so one of the first questions we received was actually around executive function skills. And it was asking um, if we know of any programs that are strong in teaching executive function skills, um, you know, acknowledging they might be calling those skills by a different names, such as socio-emotional or soft skills and so on. Um, Harry, do you have any thoughts on, on that? There's a few programs that, that I know of. Uh, there's been a little bit of research evidence on what works. Uh, but there was a, a program in New Haven called uh, New Haven Moms uh, that was studied and showed some success rate. Uh, and there's some interesting work being done by the Crittenden Women's Union uh, in Boston uh, that, that tries to target uh, women and moms at different skill levels and, and work with them. So, so we're starting to see some beginnings of some, some efforts in that area and, and some evaluation research. Fantastic. Thank you, Dr. Holzer. We have another question, uh, Nick, for you, uh, for Gateway to College. And um, the participant wanted to know whether Gateway to College is available in any rural areas. Right now, we don't have a lot of partnerships in rural areas. Um, our, our programs do tend to be in, in urban and suburban areas, although um, the program can be adapted for a rural area. The reality of it would be that it would be a much smaller program, probably, and, and have a scaled down staff. But um, you know, we're happy to work with communities that don't currently have this type of an option um, to bring a program in at a scale that, that works for the level of need in a community. Great. Thank you. And Nick, while you're with us, we have another question. A uh, participant wanted to know what percentage of your students complete the program? Right now, um, I mentioned that we, we had have you know, we experienced a lot of growth and then saw uneven outcomes. Um, and so you saw in a slide I showed that we've got a a benchmark of 50% and our, our objective is that we want to make sure that by um, 2017 all 40 of our programs are, are exceeding that benchmark of 50% completion. Right now it's, it's not there. I would say that if uh, I don't have the number directly in front of me, but I, I think that if, if we did an aggregate, um, you know, there's a range and you saw some of them were in the high end, but I think an average is probably about 35% right now. For a high school credential, or excuse me, for a high school diploma, um, some other number of students who ultimately will um, complete a GED, uh, and, and we don't have that included because our, our we hadn't previously been collecting that data. So, um, you know, like I said, I think on average we're about 35 percent for a high school diploma right now, some additional amount for a GED, and by 2017, um, because we are implementing an effort to um, bring more balance to the K-12 and the, and the college instruction, we're going to bring up some of those programs that have been struggling with an all-college implementation. Wonderful. Thank you. And we have a couple questions coming in around partnerships um, and what role certain partners can play in helping to um, open up opportunities for disconnected youth. One, one question was around public housing, what, what role public housing authorities uh, can play in helping opportunity youth. And the second one's on labor unions. Um, what kind of partnerships could be created with the labor unions to help support opportunity youth? I'll open this up to all three panelists. Does anyone have any examples of this or, or any ideas? Um, this is Farhana. Yeah, one example of a union um, partnership um, is um, the Center for Energy Workforce Development and the International Brotherhood of Electric Workers um, have um, it, the Center for Energy Workforce Development. It's a nonprofit consortium. It's formed by the electric, natural gas, and nuclear utilities and their trade associations. Um, and they essentially wanted to develop solutions to the you know workforce shortage in the, the energy industry. Um, and their employers um, worked with educators and the International Brotherhood of Electric Workers to create pathways for different types of 
um, energy carriers. Um, um, and also the, another one that comes to mind is in Washington State, um, where Boeing and the International Association of, I believe it's the Association of Machinists and Aerospace Workers, but don't hold me to it, but they operate a joint training program. Um, and, you know, that's actually financed by setting aside some money per work hour in the union contract. So there are examples out there of um, collaboration between unions and workers and um, employer associations to, um, you know, create a mechanism that can pay for training to move workers up the ladder. I'll, I'll add a few Sorry. more to that list. Um, the, the, the several construction locals run apprenticeship programs, uh, and they have pre-apprenticeship programs uh, uh, into which uh, disconnected young people can enter to try to prepare them, give them the skills preparation to actually enter an apprenticeship program. Um, there is also uh, a union local on the East Coast, Philadelphia, New York, called 1199C uh, that helps prepare uh, young people for jobs uh, in the healthcare industry uh, and in the elder care industry, uh, and, and so those are those are good examples of union involvement as well. And, and I'll, I'll I'll just pile on if I can. Sorry, Vanessa. I just because Please Farhan do. is doing an evaluation of youth build. I want to make sure sure she's aware of importantly right. the youth build <laughs> program has a, a direct entry agreement with several unions based on these pre apprenticeships that Harry spoke to. Thanks. And Harry, do you have any thoughts around the housing authorities, uh, relationships that programs can build with housing authorities or, or programs run by housing authorities? Uh, I think Youth Bill is also an example of that because Youth Bill Great. does focus a lot on, on housing uh, rehabilitation. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, we have another question coming in. Uh, they, uh, this individual would like to know more, asking how uh, she or he can learn more about models that combine work with interventions to promote behavior change um, and non-cognitive non -cognitive skills. For instance, the CBT subsidized job example that Farhana, I think, you gave. Um, any, any place you can direct uh, this person to uh, to get additional information on those kinds of models? Sure. This is this is definitely an um, an emerging area of work. Um, there isn't a lot out. I mean, that's proven out there. That's com I mean, CBT has been proven in many in different contexts to, for example, reduce re recidivism. But um, pr in terms of promotion of employment, there is not you know rigorous evidence there because it, it's still emerging. Um, the in t in t 2012, I believe. Um, University of Chicago did a study of their, their, their summer employment program there called One Summer Plus that combined a, a part-time summer job with uh, a cognitive behavioral therapy-based um, curriculum, um, and that showed um, uh, reduction in violence and, and, and some other youth outcomes, uh, improvement in some other youth outcomes. So that's one example. Um, we are currently working, I can't speak <laughs> much to, about it, but we are currently exploring ways to um, develop, uh, CBT is an umbrella term that, that's used um, for, as I said, kind of a way of thinking about restructuring thoughts um, to promote positive behavior, but there are many, there are different types of interventions that, it, you know, that can fit within that umbrella term, so we are trying to um, assess which interventions would work well to um, promote uh, employment. Um, and that, that's the area of work that's developing. Wonderful. Thank you. We have another question coming in about WIOA, the Workforce Innovation Opportunity Act, and whether or not there's any literature yet on uh, engaging youth through evidence-based programs combined with WIOA. I imagine not, since WIOA uh, is so new. Uh, but any information you provide on how uh, programs might be starting to partner with workforce development boards uh, in maybe new ways um, because of WIOA. I don't know, Harry, if that's something that you might be able to take on? Um, I, I don't know. I don't know of any literature on that or any evaluation evidence. I, I know that there is activity, uh, important activity going on, but, but I haven't seen any summaries of that activity or, or uh, for this population specifically. Great. And Farhana, is there any additional information you'd like to add in about WIOA for folks who might not be as familiar with it? Um, 
Not in that specific. I, I am not aware of. Um, I mean, this is still, as, as I said, this is going on on the ground, but I'm not aware of, of partnerships with with that um, that are successful. Great. Yes. It's, uh, it, yes. Yeah. Exactly. It's uh, it's very new. Um, Fantastic. Well, for those who aren't familiar, um, the Workforce Innovation Opportunity Act um, requires much more funding uh, than ever before to be spent on out-of-school youth. And so it really is an opportunity for workforce development boards and uh, training providers, businesses, to work together in a much more targeted and a more funded way to serve uh, opportunity youth. So there's uh, soon, soon more information, hopefully, to be coming and certainly a lot more practice to be coming down the pike there. Thank you. Um, we have another question coming in around uh, any efforts to determine if students have learning disabilities or involvement of the use of special, ed special education professionals. Nick, I'm going to pass this to you since you focus more explicitly on the education side of things. Um, is that something that your program strives to do, to learn about um, individual education plans, IEPs that students might have, and so on? That, that's an important part of the uh, the individualized services that our programs provide and I'll you know acknowledge that it can be a challenge to provide service to students with an IEP in a college setting because colleges by um, by law are governed by a different set of rules by um, ADA rather than IDEA when it comes to um, uh, individualized services for you know dealing with disabilities etc what we find is that if during the enrollment process there is an explicit effort to connect with families and the school district if a student is referred who has an IEP. Um, most of our programs will ha set up an IEP meeting at that time and determine whether or not the additional services that are available on a college campus or simply the you know, case management services that are available via the coach or the resource specialist meets the needs of a student's IEP. Um, about 10% of our students um, do have an IEP. Um, so it's not uh, kind of out of proportion to what you might find in a mainstream high school, um, but what we do find is that, that there are students who, you know, fit there um, very well. Um, and, and actually that doesn't tend to be um, any type of a barrier that, that holds those students back um, in relative to the rest of our population. Great. Thank you. And, and Rahana, not, another question. Have... Yeah, go ahead. No, I was going to say um, I didn't speak earlier about the when, um, the housing question, um, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. and I believe Her um, Dr. Holzer answered about youth build, and, and he's exactly right. But I also wanted to point that person to our website for our Jobs Plus study. Um, this is a study that's not specifically for youth, but it 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 it, it tried to. Um, Incentivize. I mean, it's it's try. It it was very effective in increasing earnings among public housing residents, um, and it had three components, including a you know obviously employment related services like job job search assistance, um, some rent based incentives, and also a strategy called community support for work, which um, which consisted of a f efforts to involve residents in neighbor to neighbor information sharing about like work opportunities you know um, in the in the community so I would encourage them to look at that even though it's not specifically for youth it is a public housing based initiative that has shown uh, results great thank you so much Farhana um, another question that's come in is regarding how to potentially pass knowledge or train workforce development providers in positive youth development. You know, the question is that the statement uh, from the participant was that a lot of what we're talking about seems to be you know, related to positive youth development um, you know, regarding treating people in an individualized manner with an individualized approach in a positive manner. Um, and the question is, you know, does, does this positive youth development approach come naturally to workforce development providers? Is there capacity building that's needed uh, in that space? I don't know, Harry, if you have any thoughts on that? Well, uh, my guess is that, that, that some workforce development specialists are, are better at it than others. Uh, some are, uh, are more familiar uh, with, with youth issues than others. Uh, so when you look around the country, for instance, uh, there, 
was and, and is a, a Philadelphia youth network uh, that, that combines a lot of the youth we have funds uh, and integrates a lot of these programs. And, uh, you know, that, that's a great mechanism for, uh, for making uh, workforce development specialists uh, aware of, of youth issues and, and targeting better towards them. And, and there are other such uh, efforts around the country. Now, of course, the, the budgets are very, very constrained. Uh, the we owe of budgets in this area, so it's it's hard to put a lot of money into training uh, individuals. But but there are there are some nice efforts around the country to to make people more aware and, and to target people more more effectively. Uh, some some of the youth the former youth opportunity sites uh, that have survived over time and gotten their own funding also provide some mechanisms for doing that. Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Holzer. And, and one follow-up question to you, um, you know, related to just some of the changing and changes in our economy uh, over the past decade or two and, and how we can adjust to them or continue to adjust. question is on uh, the increased automation uh, in our industries, uh, you know, in many of our communities, and asking what local communities or states can do to address you know, the increasing automation and kind of uh, change, shift to more skilled uh, jobs? Well, I think, I think what automation has done so far, uh, automation has really eliminated uh, middle, middle wage jobs uh, that used to go to uh, high school graduates or less, uh, a lot of production jobs, a lot of clerical jobs. Uh, those jobs have either disappeared or, or pay a lot less than they used to because of automation. What that means is that we have to now better target uh, other kinds of jobs uh, that, that, that pay well but that have higher skill demands uh, in industries like uh, healthcare, uh, advanced manufacturing, IT, transportation and logistics, hospitality, uh, the, the, some of the higher end of, of retail trade. Um, of course, our, many community colleges are trying to do that. Farhana talked about, about sector-based strategies and career pathway programs that often target those sectors that continue to have good paying jobs, uh, but that now simply require more skill uh, than they used to in the past, uh, and, and efforts to, to get our disconnected young people uh, into those post-secondary programs, efforts like Gateway and, and others to do that, uh, I think are, are the best the best efforts we know of to, to try to deal with that issue. Great. Thank you so much. Um, Rahana, I have a question for you regarding trauma-informed care. Um, and, you know, if you've seen any programs or any good examples of how programs that are serving this population are potentially embedding trauma-informed care principles into their work. Yeah, so as I said, um, most of the programs that um, work with youth um, is, a pro it, you know, as far as I know, is adopting um, some form of cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, and uh, it's been adapted into a variety of, you know, specified treatment models, um, and many of which are considered evidence-based. So, um, for example, uh, a re uh, Becoming a Man in Chicago, a recent, it's a program for young men in grades 7 to 10. Um, researchers at the University of Chicago found that, you know, combining regular interaction with positive adult role models um, and uh, a CBT approach in after-school programming um, reduced, you know, violent and nonviolent arrests by nearly half. And it's also it also seemed to boost positive schooling outcomes. Um, so I would I would uh, it, it also like CBT seems to work well when it's when you follow a really structured curriculum and the and the curriculum and the level of evidence can vary. So it's it's difficult for me to point to a specific curriculum and say this is going to work for everyone. Um, I think. Um, and we know that not everything works for everyone. For example, we, we uh, tested a CBT approach um, at Rikers, um, that Adolescent Behavioral Learning Experience, um, which tested a, you know, CBT to reduce recidivism, and we didn't find um, any impacts. Uh, actually, the program was implemented by MDRC, but the Vera, Vera Institute of Justice did the evaluation. Um, so their context really matters, right? So um, I would say that. Um, you know, you have to look at the target population and you have to look at the context before picking 
um, the type of trauma-informed um, approach that you want to take. And unfortunately, it's not my content area of expertise, so I can't go beyond that, but that's my take. Great. Thank you. Um, I think we had another question come in through our Twitter feed, which we certainly would love to address. Um, and I'll, uh, I'll put this both to Harry and Nick. Um, any insight you could provide on programs that have been particularly targeting uh, working with Latino youth uh, or Latinas, um, or, or any differential impacts you've seen on the Latino community through the programs, uh, through your program, Nick, that you um, work on, or Harry, the programs you've seen evaluations on? Um, uh, there's a program in Chicago, uh, and the name of which I, I always have trouble remembering, uh, remembering. It's run by Juan uh, Salgado. Uh, it's a very good sector-based program, uh, both for youth and adults. Uh, that's a very good program. Uh, and, and there's an effort here in, in Washington, D.C. Uh, for Latino youth uh, run by uh, Lori Kaplan. Uh, I haven't seen evaluation evidence on it, but, but it, looks, it looks quite strong as well. What I, what I could add to that, um, you know, I would say probably won't be shocking to anyone here, but, you know, it kind of speaks to um, you know, just the, the various demographics of our communities around the country. Um, there are a number of gateway to college programs that are in communities where there is um, a majority of Latino students, in some cases, you know, uh, almost exclusively Latino students. And really, I think what is, what is critical there in those communities is that the programs are, you know, necessarily, and, and doing good work to do this, uh, making connections to the, the broader Latino community. And, and making sure that information about the program is available um, to community-based organizations that are, that are providing culturally specific services. And then the programs themselves are seeking training in order to be able to provide, to provide culturally specific services. And so for a few of our partner programs that are at um, you know, Hispanic-serving institutions, that, that's not necessarily a big challenge. It's, it's, it's part of a, you know, how they approach their community and how they approach their work in general. But for some of our programs, it is something that they've needed to be delivered about, especially in instances where we have staff members who might not um, reflect the, the ethnic or racial background of our students. We, we need to you know, either have deliberate hiring or deliberate training or both to make sure that we're being as responsive as possible. Um, you know, I don't know if this was implicit in the question, but one of the um, questions, of course, that may follow that is um, to what degree is, a, is an intervention like this or other interventions we talked about appropriate for ELL students. And, and I will say that within Gateway to College, um, we see that for kind of higher level ELL students, um, they, they tend to be able to um, matriculate directly from an ELL program to Gateway to College with relative success. But for students who are, who are really early on and, and maybe lower level, level one, level two, um, with their English language, because of the nature of Gateway being a college-based program, um, it, it, unfortunately, it, it's a longer road for them. Um, the, the program that Dr. Holder, Holder mentioned is in D.C., um, I'm actually quite excited about it. it. There's an impact evaluation coming out this year. It's at the Latin American Youth Center. Uh, it's the Promoter Pathway Program, and it's a long-term case management program where um, case managers work with young people for up to four to six years. So this is, um, uh, I'm excited about seeing evidence for, for this model. Fantastic. So um, we'll just do, uh, close out with one final question so we can wrap up. Um, there's a, there, was, there were two questions related to how do we kind of advocate for additional funding in this, in this arena, um, you know, and advocate for policy changes that might support, um, you know, further work with opportunity use. And I think the question was both, you know, what can we do as, as practitioners or researchers, policymakers, but what also can youth do um, to further advocate for themselves and for these kinds of programs? Um, would love to hear um, each person's take on this, um, what your thoughts are, and then we can wrap up. Harry, if you'd like to start. Yeah, I, I, I think uh, a couple of things work. Number one, uh, uh, what all of us have talked about, having evidence, having rigorous evidence uh, of, of impacts 
uh, is very important. I mean, it, it's, it's virtually impossible at the federal level and even at most state level uh, for programs that, that if you don't have rigorous evidence, uh, you're not going to make a very effective case uh, for your programs. So, so that's really important to have. Uh, and, and secondly, there, there's an argument about just how costly it is not to address this problem, uh, the costs of, of health care for this population, the costs in the criminal justice system are, are, are just massive. Uh, and interestingly, I think on criminal justice has actually been a, a, a big political change. Uh, conservatives uh, are, are now really reaching the same conclusion, that this is a huge waste of money uh, and that we need to, to treat these young people differently and, and not just rely on, on uh, incarceration. So, so I think that, that gives us all an opportunity. Um, but, but in terms of the last part of your question, what can young people do for themselves, there are, I, I, sometimes there have been some very powerful stories told by young people who had a really rough start in life and, and who, who disconnected and maybe got in trouble with the law and, and, and who managed to reconnect with the aid of one of these programs. And I, I, found those, I find those, those stories uh, just as powerful as the evidence. Uh, and, and a few, you know, a, a few well-placed stories like that, I think, can make a difference as well. Thank you, Harry. Uh, Nick, any final thoughts to add? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll just tag on that. I agree 100% with Harry. Uh, we were down in our state capital, Salem, um, earlier this week, working with uh, legislatures on a bill to, to have more re-engagement options for out-of-school youth, and um, having a lobbyist, or excuse me, a legislative aide there who was a former Gateway to College student was a very compelling part of that. So that's absolutely critical. And then I'll just say, you know, I think that, that the economic argument that Harry was talking about is critical. And there's a, there's a really crass workforce argument to be made, which is that our economy no longer has those positions that Harry was talking about for young people who don't have a high school diploma. And so if we've got an expectation that everyone has um, yeah, high school credential and post-secondary training, we just don't get there if we leave 20% behind. Thank you, Nick. Parhana. Um, I'm going to obviously um, stress the need for um, adoption of, of, of interventions and programs and practices that have some rigorous evidence behind them, um, especially when you're really thinking about um, adopting them at scale. But also, um, you know, isn't there a saying called all politics is local? So I'd like to adopt, adopt that saying to this context to say um, I, think, I think there can be a lot done on a local level, like as Nick was saying, reaching out to um, local policymakers, reaching out to local employers, reaching out to whether it's for, um, whether it's youth, whether it's the, the programs, and I just think that local engagement can make a huge difference. Wonderful. Thank you all so much for your time on this panel and your preparation for it, and thank you to our participants for your fantastic questions. We really appreciate it, and uh, please fill out the survey uh, to let us know how, uh, how, how your experience of the um, panel and webinar was. Thank you so much. That concludes today's conference. Thank you for your participation.